very kindly introduced our new unit, which is a nice, uh, nice intro to what we're going to talk about today, which really is the role of academia and how you sync that uh, academic component of work with your clinical work. Um, and that's really what I want to focus on tonight. And we're going to have a sort of a hop, skip and a jump. And please do uh, interrupt. Vikram's going to be uh, be running the questions and Q&A and he's going to jump in and interrupt me. So if you've got a burning question, just pop it in the chat and delighted to answer those as we go along. So um, I'm really thrilled to be able to talk to you tonight and uh, glad to join you from QMUL and East London uh, Bart's Health. So I thought we'd kick off with just a couple of questions, see, see where we are. So uh, Vikram, if you pop up the first um, poll, just want to see who's on the call tonight. Um, so if we can have the audience poll up, and if everyone just uh, pops their details in there, we'll give you a couple of minutes. And then when you're ready, Vikram, I'm sure that shouldn't have been too difficult a question for people. You can try and fire up the results. There we go. Excellent. Well, great to have a nice range of people and um, good to hear that most people are core trainees as briefed. Hopefully then what we're going to talk about today is particularly relevant to the core trainees um, as they're looking to move forwards to their ST interviews. For those of you who uh, are medical students and uh, and other grades of doctors, it won't be long before you're knocking on the door for those interviews. So this will all be relevant to you. And lots of opportunities uh, happening out in East London, which I want to tell you a little bit about tonight, um, which are relevant across the spectrum of different uh, different uh, grades. OK, let's have the um, second uh, poll up there then, Vikram. This is a poll about what you want to achieve at the end of this session. So your aspirations at the end of the session. I just want to get a certificate so that I can get my um, I can get my appraisal done. Let's have a look then. We'll try and tailor what we talk about tonight. Do well at ST interviews. God. It's amazing how you can motivate people to do uh, to do what you want them to do. Um, fantastic. Well, that's a that's a very laudable aim, and it makes sense with the audience. I'm very excited to see forty percent of us interested in getting involved in research, and there'll be lots of things I'm going to talk about today, which I hope will just show you doorways that you can push open. Okay. So just to get going, I'm going to go straight in at the ST interviews. What is the first thing? that I think people might ask you about in an ST interview. So we're gonna target a question that I think up comes up really commonly. And I have sat on those interview panels. So one of the questions that I often ask people is, have you ever heard of levels of evidence? So this pyramid here, uh, I'd be surprised if anyone has not seen this pyramid. It was first developed in McMaster, came out of the evidence-based medicine unit there, headed up by Gordon Geyer and others. And this is a pyramid which supposedly tells us that there's different levels of evidence. The purple at the top is the, uh, is the top quality evidence and the green at the bottom is the lowest quality evidence. Now, my issue here is that all of these types of studies, and these are the ones that you'll often see written down and there's various different versions of this, so I wouldn't get too bogged down into the nitty gritty of is it a type 2b versus a type 3, it doesn't really matter. Um, the important thing about this pyramid is that this pyramid was initially written about studies which are testing something about how well a treatment works. And we call that effectiveness or efficacy. And we can talk a little bit if people are interested in what the difference is, but we're interested in how well your treatment improves your patient's outcomes. So how effective is the treatment? When you're considering studies trying to answer that question, this is the right kind of approach or the right kind of pyramid you should be thinking about. So meta-analysis, potentially at the top, you can argue about that versus a well-conducted, very large, definitive, pragmatic trial. That might actually be better. Some people like to invert that pyramid on the top two rows. Then we've got non-randomized comparative studies. 
Um, those might be studies where hospital A does it one way, hospital B does it another way, or in the 80s, we did it like this, in the 90s, we did it like this. Purely observational studies, which don't really have control groups, which are well structured. And then case reports slash expert opinions slash how my boss taught me to do it. Um, and they sit down at the bottom. The really crucial thing that I think the nuance which you can bring out in the interview is this triangle is only true, or this pyramid is only true in this way if you're asking a question about effectiveness. So if you want to know about what is the influence of a risk factor on disease, such as how does smoking produce cancer or does smoking increase your chances of lung cancer, you do not want to do a randomized control trial. That's the worst possible design you can have. What you want to do is very large observational prospective cohort studies, which is exactly what Richard Dahl and his colleagues in Oxford did when they discovered the link between smoking and cancer. So the key thing is understand the type of question you're asking. And because we're orthopedic surgeons are interested in doing stuff, we're often interested in how effective our treatments. But don't forget, if you're an epidemiologist or you're interested in preventing disease, you're a physician, actually the types of studies you might need might well be different. And the order of those study designs might be different. So I recommend you go and look at the Center for Evidence-Based Medicine from McMaster, look at their website. They've got all the different types of triangles and they've expanded it up now. Um, really important. Now, why might that come up in your interview? Well, it might come up in your interview because there's been a relatively exciting new publication come out. I'm going to let you just sort of absorb that and see who's been following their ortho Twitter feed um, or just reading the Daily Mail because it has appeared in the Daily Mail. And um, Vikram, I'm going to ask you to pop up the uh, role of randomized controlled trials um, uh, voting poll. And I want to get a view. We talked about what the level one evidence is. Um, I just want to get a view from people as about what they think randomized controlled trials, level one or potentially level one B, um, how good are they at helping you uh, run your practice? And I'd be fascinated to see this because I think this is going to really explain some of the controversy that we've seen uh, in response to that article from Bristol. So if we can pop up the result. Good for judging effectiveness. This is amazing. You guys are really listening. Um, they are slow, expensive and really helpful. That is not fully true, but they are slow and expensive but are very helpful if you want to understand how well your treatment works. Um, part of the big picture, that's a very mature answer. And it's the one that I would recommend that you use when you're talking about the role of randomized controlled trials in your interview, because you probably won't get interviewed by me uh, or someone like me. You'll probably get interviewed by an orthopedic surgeon who is not a pure academic and is coalescing information from their patients, from their own previous experience, from case series, because they may be the best, and then perhaps one or two small randomized trials, which are not real big hitters in the field. So how does this particular study cause a lot of controversy? And if you're not sure that it has caused controversy, jump on the BOA website when you get off of here and uh, have a quick look at what the BOA have had to say about it, because they're pretty upset. Um, Listen, it's a, it's a perfectly reasonable systematic review. So they've done it in a systematic way. They've got a good quality search. They've looked across the literature and they said what they're gonna do in their methods. So I think methodologically, there's not an issue with what they've done uh, in the sense that they have performed the study that they said they would do. The question is, is in the interpretation. And the thrust of this particular study, in my opinion, was to look for how much level one evidence is out there to support some of the really common things that we do. And I'll be talking at Psychot in a couple of weeks time about what's the role of randomized trials in trying to understand how our practice should develop. Um, and I think it's crucial because some things where you're not sure of effectiveness should be tested with randomized controlled trials. I, I think that, and, and that's the thrust of what these authors were saying. 
The problem is, is that they lumped in some relatively con uh, contentious uh, interventions like debridement of a chronic meniscal tear uh, with arthroscopy, where there's lots of randomized trials and you, know, you can argue the toss in lots of different ways. They've lumped it in with something like total hip replacement. And I don't think you could find a surgeon in the UK who would uh, have equipoise for the delivery of a randomized controlled trial in people with standard OA of their hip. Um, and so we do need to be cognizant of the fact that randomized trials are only appropriate when we're uncertain of the quality of the treatment. The problem is that that uncertainty is not a single line. It's an envelope of uncertainty. And we're running a trial at the moment uh, comparing operative fixation of unstable ankle fractures with a type of cast. And it's pretty controversial. And the reason it's controversial is some people like me aren't convinced that internal fixation is definitely better. It might be better, for sure it might be, but I'm not convinced. Whereas other people think that the evidence base is adequate. And that's where you get this kind of rub up against each other. So I would say you don't always need a randomized trial unless the treatment is relatively contentious, in which case it's probably OK. And the best way to understand that is to get involved with large multi-center audits. So that's going to bring me on to my next area. What the hell is the difference between audit research and this little thing, service evaluation, just down here at the bottom? Um, so audit research, the two big hitters. Um, why is this important? This is important because this could well come up in your interview. And one thing that really annoys me is when people lump it all together in their CV because they're two or three distinct types of work. So research is when you are asking an unknown question about something and you are uh, trying to generate new evidence, which is applicable to a greater uh, population of patients. So you might answer it with a small group of patients in your hospital, but you're hoping to produce a research response that is applicable to the entire UK perhaps. So what is audit? Well, audit is evaluating your own practice or a, a group of people's practice against a standard. That is the crucial bit, against a recognized standard. You can select the recognized standard and you may need to make an argument as to why that's an appropriate standard, but you must have a standard, the BOA standards for trauma, for example, or the NICE guideline or my hospital protocol. Whatever it is, you must have a standard and your audit is relating what you're doing or your group of people or your group of patients compared to what one is supposed to be doing. So audit is a very specific type of cross-sectional research um, where there's already a standard. So you're not trying to generate new information or new knowledge. And what service evaluation? Well, that sort of sits in between. It's closer to audit than research because of the governance that's in place. So if you want to do research with NHS patients, you have to go to the NHS research and ethics committees. It's quite a big deal. If you want to do audit, you have to go to your own local R&D department. It's relatively lower um, uh, barrier to get over because uh, the burden for the patients is much lower. Service evaluation is when you do the first part of an audit, i.e. you find out what's going on in your own practice, but you don't have a standard with which to compare it. So you're just reporting what you're doing. So it's sort of a subset of an audit in that sense. OK. This, I think, is, um, I, was, I was saying to the guys beforehand that we haven't really got the time to go through a whole bunch of papers, but I would be delighted to sit down and do and do a relatively in-depth uh, uh, journal club type uh, uh, session on the fundamentals of orthopedics. And uh, I think the, the team are going to take us up on that. So they'll be touching base with you all uh, down the line. But again, I just want to come on to the... Um, how we might answer a question in the interview about, tell me about a paper that you've read recently. Uh, that's the classic, right? So that is the no brainer examiner's question for uh, tell me about your research understanding. So you've got to have a paper in your back pocket that you're ready to talk about. Uh, and it needs to be uh, relatively uh, available 
ideally one that people have heard of. So one of the big studies or something in the bone and joint journal. Don't go digging around looking for some tiny niche thing. You want some sort of mass appeal that everyone's going to understand. Because remember, the people that are interviewing you may not share the same interests and many of them may not be orthopedic surgeons. So something really general or generic. And these are the things that you are going to have to pick out of your paper before you get into that interview. And you need to be able to just talk about this uh, in a coherent way, flowingly, with good understanding. And if you just run through this pattern, it's like when you get to Viva time, you're going to recognize people that are good at Vivas because they don't let the examiner speak. And they just keep going. So I would ask the question, tell me about a paper. And before I got the sentence out, you've got going and you're gonna to get to the end uh, before they need to ask you anything else. So let's run through each of these. Top of it, population. And what do I mean by population? Okay, this is really easy. Forget the abstract, forget the introduction. You go straight to the methods part of the paper and it has got to describe the population. So that means you'll often see it as patients and methods. And in the first couple of paragraphs, it ought to tell you what the population under the, uh, the study conditions was. So 70 year old women who had a hip fracture um, and then came into hospital with renal failure. You know, that's the description of a population. Uh, it's very easy, so you can pull that out. You're not gonna need to know every little tiny detail, just enough so that I understand as a listener, okay, these are the sorts of people we're talking about, people with primary OA people with ACL ruptures, uh, people with shoulder cuff arthropathy who are uh, over 60. Now, I get, you know, I get it. I don't need all the tiny details. And then the next two, intervention and comparator. I would, for the sake of having something to talk about, choose a relatively good paper, which means it ought to have a control group or a comparator group, which means you really want to see two interventions described. And again, I've made that quiet assumption that we're looking at a paper, looking at effectiveness. So you wanna look at the intervention, you wanna look at the comparator and you wanna be able to describe them. Again, it doesn't have to be word perfect. You just need to describe the important features. So if we're looking at a hip replacement paper versus dual mobility versus standard articulation, then you might wanna know cemented, uncemented, what sizes were available, uh, was it just primary hips? What was the indication for the surgery well, who were the surgeons that were carrying out the surgery were they hip surgeons or were they general orthopedic surgeons was it done in specialist centers or was it done in the whole of the uk these are the sorts of things so that i can get a grip of what the treatments that are under the test conditions are really like is it something relevant to my practice okay then you need to come straight out with the primary outcome. So the primary outcome ought to be written down as the primary outcome in the method section. Often it's not. If there's a sample size calculation, you can infer that the primary outcome is the sample size uh, calculation one. Or you can just think about what the outcomes are in the paper, think about the question and decide which is the most relevant to you. It doesn't hugely matter. You just need to pick an outcome and I wouldn't worry about all the secondary outcomes, just choose one outcome and just come straight out of the bat and say, okay, the primary outcome for the study was the Harris hip score at six months. Okay, whatever it is, that's it. So you need whatever the measure is and when it was taken and then state the result. And don't get involved in some massive discussion just state the results. So if your primary outcome was a Harris hip score, don't worry about all the other outcomes. Just focus in on that Harris hip score and tell us what the result was. Now, if you can remember the numbers, yeah, okay, straight to the top of the class. If you can't remember the numbers, then tell us which direction the benefit was in. So did it favor the intervention or did it favor the comparison? Was it a big difference or was it a small difference? So what was the magnitude of the difference? And was the difference significant or not? If you can remember those three things, that'd be great. If you can back that up with the actual numbers, particularly the confidence intervals, those are the magic two numbers, then you're golden. And then here's your little bit where you can just sort of sell this. So this is where you fit it into context. and You don't get too, you don't get too dogmatic about the type of design. You just say this uh, fits in with information from other sources that suggests that we can do 
dual mobility or that we should treat cuff arthropathy with slings or whatever it is. Um, so population intervention, comparison, outcome, result, and how it affects your practice. That'll take you about four or five minutes. If you get through that, you're gonna smash that question out of the park, no problems. Okay, so we're gonna have a little break. We're gonna ask one more poll. Um, I'm gonna ask you a little bit about why you think you wanna be involved in research. So for, I think it was 39% of people said that they wanted to have opportunities for getting involved in research, and we're gonna focus on that now. So let's pop that up. Research is gonna be controversial. Okay, let's have it back. Key part of my practice. I feel like my work is done tonight. Uh, nice to have, yeah. I think that, I think that is a, a very common uh, feeling amongst most clinicians. You know, we're busy, busy people and uh, trying to squeeze another thing into life is quite hard. Uh, important, but not for me, no problem. Useless for my practice, that was me. So uh, I don't want to have an empty box. Okay, so opportunities. Here's where the best opportunities in the UK for doing research are right now. Funnily enough, it's uh, with us down in Barts. So get online. Um, you can see all of the uh, different places that you can follow us and catch up. Uh, I'm thrilled to meet people, talk to people on Zoom, whatever it is. Um, our website will be going live probably in the next uh, two to three weeks. That's just a holding page at the moment. But in the interim, drop me an email, send me a text, uh, whatever it is, um, and, uh, and get in touch. There's going to be lots of opportunities. I'm just going to sort of skip through them briefly now um, because we can't talk about all of them. But that's not to say we're not open for business. Okay, so this is a fantastic, and I'm sure you all recognize what it is. This is the BOTA webpage, and this is the best, or uh, BOTA website, and this is the best webpage on it. It's the research page. I absolutely love this, um, this work that BOTA have done. Uh, it has completely transformed the accessibility of all the studies that are happening around the UK. And I am particularly interested in uh, these two on uh, on the right hand side as you're looking at the screen so the center tno trials those are randomized controlled trials they're all multi-center studies and i'm going to talk a little bit about how you at your level can get involved in running a trial in your hospital so that is going to come up now if you want to find what trials are happening out there there's going to be a few ways but one of the ways is click on that link and that's going to take you to every hospital in the UK has got a little sticker on a Google map and it tell you which trials are open. And the other on the right hand side there is trainee projects. Okay, so trainee projects are the multi-center audit type of work or service evaluation sometimes because often we don't have an audit standard against which to make a comparison and we are looking for variation in practice. Why are we looking for variation in practice? Well, how do you prove that that envelope of uncertainty, that envelope of equipoise is actually an envelope as opposed to, yeah, we all agree. This person with OA hip gets a hip replacement. We don't need a randomized trial. That's not very reflective of most clinical problems. So how do we show that we don't know as a community how to treat this problem? Well, we take the same problem, ankle fracture, knee uh, ACL rupture, and we look around the UK and we see what practice is being done. And what we find nine times out of 10 is that the practice is highly variable. And the same patient with the same problem coming into a different hospital would get a different treatment. And that means we can't possibly know how best to treat people. And that's where randomized trials are key at establishing effectiveness. And so you can see now how those trainee collaboratives, which allow us to do super rapid uh, my, my, I've been amazed by how well uh, the team uh, across the entire UK have put together the open fracture study and how brilliant that is. That's almost a thousand people recruited now in just a couple of months. And it's going to, I tell you, it will be eye opening to look at the variation in practice. They then feed into future trials. 
So um, I would get onto those websites. I think they're really, really helpful. But I said that I was going to talk a little bit about trials. Now, no big trials happen in the UK. That's almost true. No big trials happen in the UK without these guys getting involved uh, and funding it. Uh, there are some orthopedic, uh, when I say no trials, I mean no orthopedic trials. Uh, there are some orthopedic studies funded by other organizations, but actually, you know, these are the big hitters. So NIHR is the place to go. And you as trainees want to be all over that website understanding all the opportunities NIHR are throwing out there because it doesn't matter what path you're going to take in medicine NIHR have got some opportunities and funding and courses available for you uh, many of them funded courses so um, get onto the NIHR website and what I would say particularly is this thing called the associate PI scheme so we can zoom in here this is on the website associate principal investigator scheme They've just completely overhauled all the electronic back end to this. It used to be really clunky with Excel spreadsheets and Google Sheets, et cetera. It's really swish now, looking really good, works much better. Great thing is the guys in Bota, they have uh, totally dialed into this now and you will get access to all of the associate PI scheme studies through the Bota website. If you want to get involved and you can't find your way through, you can go on to the study websites running out of Oxford or York or QM or wherever it is, or just get involved with it. Get it. Ask the chief investigator. Just send them an email. You'll definitely be able to find it if you Google their, their trial. So what is an associate PI? Well, the first thing is what's a PI, a principal investigator. So a principal investigator is someone like uh, Lucky who's in a hospital, who's got a full time clinical practice, but is interested in answering a question. And either leads or uh, collaborates with colleagues, say through BOFAS, um, who are running a study. And he then becomes the person in the hospital that's running it. And uh, that's often a consultant grade. It's not actually mandatory, but it's often a consultant grade a person who's got a permanent contract in the hospital and they do the paperwork with support. It's, re it's relatively light touch what they actually have to do. And they keep the bandwagon rolling. So they're the people that people like me call up and say, why haven't you recruited anyone this month? Um, so they are the major cheerleaders in the hospital and they fix any problems that happen on the site. So what's an associate PI? Associate PI is a training appointment that allows you to figure out how to become a PI. So that when you go to your ST3 interview or when you go to your consultant interview, you say, I've already been an associate PI. I've, here's my certificate from NHL, and there is one. Here's my 25 people that I've recruited and got certificates for their recruitment. Um, I know how to be a person that helps deliver UK-wide top quality research in my field, because that's the reality of, of actually what the PIs are doing. All of the trials that people get you know, lauded for, um, actually the work is done by the PIs. Most of the work is done by the PIs in the sense that they're the people that actually recruit the patients or convince their colleagues to recruit the patients. So if you can prove to an appointments committee, whatever level you're at, that you're ready to go as a PI, then you are five rungs up the ladder. And if I was listening to you and you were spouting off about your CV and this, that, and the other case report that you'd done, I wouldn't care. If you said, well, I've done an associate PI and I've managed to recruit this number of people and I've set this study up from scratch in my hospital. I'd be like, okay, this is somebody we need here. This person actually knows how to do research. So associate PI scheme, get on board. The Royal College of Surgeons are hugely actually drove this and NIHR picked it up and ran with it. Um, so you can find it on the Royal College of Surgeons of England website. And I think actually um, across all of the colleges in surgery, and you can get onto the NIHR website as well. Um, in terms of the other area that I was talking about, sorry, in terms of the other area that I was talking about, which was the multi-center audit uh, work, I think that is really crucial as well. And we need people in all the sites to be recruiting for those. Why do we need that? Well, because we want to show variation in practice, more sites than more variation is possible for us to find potentially. The, uh, we, only, we don't want one or two you know, exemplar centers, we'll find out what's happening in the real world. So 
How do you get involved with that? Well, get onto the BOTA website. Um, this time you're going to click over on trainee projects. And when you go onto the trainee projects, you will see that the open BOTA accredited, i.e. you're going to get credit for being involved in them because the paperwork uh, is up and running. You're going to get authorship. Um, all of the things that you expect as a participant in, in conducting the research is going to be available to you. It's not a fly by night cowboy project. So I would use the BOTA as a seal of approval, go through their website and then register. You can have as many investigators in your hospital as you wish. I think in the rural London for the open fracture, I've got about six trainees uh, heading that up and each project's different. It doesn't matter. Uh, I can't go through the details of each one, but all of them that I know of have led to uh, major publications in some of the uh, some of the bigger specialty journals, subspecialty journals, and at least one of them has led on to a NIHR funded randomized trial. Um, that was one of the earlier ones that was set up, but I'm sure that they will feed through down the line. Okay. So I'm going to stop there for a moment. I've got lots more to say that I can talk about, but um, Vikram, I thought I might ask you if you've got any questions lined up and then we can hopefully talk about things the audience want to talk about rather than what I think are important. Hi, right, yeah, sure. So we've got uh, a couple of questions. First of all is what is your email address? Um, that one I can probably, uh, I, can, yeah. I can put it up now or... I can That's fine. Um, yeah, so people are very welcome to drop me an email. It's just x.griffin at qmul.ac.uk. But you just Google me. Don't send okay. it to my Oxford address because I don't use it anymore. Okay, so what was that? x.griffin at qmul.ac.uk. Yeah, okay, fine. I'll put that up. Um, I've got That's it. Yeah. So can a core surgical trainee be an associate PI or only uh, SPR and above? No, anyone can. Uh, so... So a PI, uh, in fact, from a governance point of view, um, anybody can be a PI and therefore anybody can be an associate PI. But the reality is the risk is held by your R&D department. And uh, they are, there are certain things that are required of a PI and therefore the hospital and the R&D department has got a responsibility to make sure that the person that they're going to sign off to say this person's a PI in our hospital. Um, they've got some traction over them. And so they normally require a long-term contract and that makes it difficult for most trainees to become PIs. Um, it's not impossible and I have seen it before, but certainly anyone with a long-term allied health professionals, physios, OTs, lots of people uh, from non-medical fields uh, as PIs. Associate PIs, you can be anybody. Medical students can be associate PIs, anybody. So the person that makes a decision about whether you can be an associate PI is the chief investigator on the advice of the principal investigator. So that might be, you know, lucky call, you know, dropping me an email and saying, like, I've got this really fantastic medical student, they're gonna be with us for three years, or I've got this fantastic CT1 uh, who's gonna rotate around a couple of times. And they're mad keen to find out about, you know, tiny bones of the foot and how to treat them. Uh, can, can, they be, can they be on the um, uh, associate PI schedule? And I just say, yes, I'm never going to, I'm never going to disagree with the PI. So I would recommend get onto the BOTA website, find out which studies are running in your hospital, find out which studies are running across the UK. The easiest way to do this is to get on board as an associate PI. And you can have more than one per center per study and register, basically go and speak to the PI and say, listen, you know, miss X, Y, Z, I want to do this. They'll say yes, and then the process will kick off. If you um, if you really want a gold star, and you really want everyone to know who you are, then getting a study open in your site as an associate PI is like the Jedi move, and um, you'll you'll be uh, you'll be loved, and uh, your name will be lauded from Twitter. But um, the way to do that is to find out what studies are running in the UK and uh which is easy you can do that through the boater website or you can do it through the nihr website you can look up orthopedics and shortlist all the studies and then you think this is the one i'm interested in and then go and find a consultant that's got an interest in that area and convince them that they want to open the study there as the pi 
that that's several moves um, more difficult because there's a few more moves. But if you pull that off, then uh, that's good work. I've I've had a couple couple of people do, it, and they're on my Christmas list now. Um, thank you for that, Prof. Uh, I've got one. I've got one, two more questions. Uh, as a PI or associate PIs, are you typically a named author on published research? So yeah, well. so that's a really great question. So I still have many of my studies running in Oxford because once you set a study up, it's um, it's a major heartache to move it. So if you go to the Endorms, I, I barely can barely say their words anymore. If you go to the Endorms website and you look up some of the studies that I'm involved in, like um, White Nine or Fame or Wax, you click through to those, you'll see that there's a, a, a Word document that'll get pulled down, which is the authorship agreement. So any associate PI, or in fact, anyone that gets involved in the study, what we do is we basically um, award a certain number of points for different activities. So if you recruit some patients, you get some points. If you help set the study up, you get more points, et cetera, et cetera. To try and be fair and above board, if you get over a certain threshold, and it says that on the piece of paper, then you get, you get authorship. So the way these studies are being published now depends a little bit on the journal, but most of them are being published as a trial group because of the reflection of the fact that this is much bigger than one person's project. So or three or four named authors projects so what you need to do is um, try and publish them as a group so you know the wax collaborative or something like that sometimes uh, journals just the particular way they sync with pubmed and medline uh, struggle with that and so they'll have three or four named authors on behalf of but then when you get your pubmed index as an individual if you're uh, labelled within that collaborative group, then you will get your uh, authorship recognised by Medline. So Medline are all set up now for, so like Faith and Health, which are published uh, around hip fracture by Mo Bandari, they've got multiple hundreds of investigators and they're just published as a single group, the health group. But if you go in and you look up one of the health investigators on Medline, the health paper comes up as one of their papers. Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. And um, one more question. So someone has asked, how does one write a study protocol for a prospective randomized control trial? Any tips? <laughs> it's a great question. Um, lucky we've only got two and a half years to answer it. Um, so uh, that is a very big question. So these documents are, you know, depending upon whether they're commercial or non-commercial studies, it might run between 30 and 100 pages. So it's a big, a big thing. Um, the protocol essentially should describe everything about the conduct of the study, of any relevance to the study, so that you as a reader can figure out what it is that people said they were going to do before they analyze the data, essentially. Um, so the protocol that you see published in, you know, Bone and Joint Open or, or um, BMC Musculoskeletal, places we often publish, or, or Bone and Joint Research, slightly dry thing a protocol paper with no data in but they're crucial those are abridged versions uh cut down to just a few thousand words um the actual thing behind it which is often put in a repository is uh, multiple multiple pages so uh why don't i ask a follow-up question what what does he want to know about writing the protocol the sorts of things that need to go in there so he's asked that question. I think I think he's uh so it's M R Chowdhury. I think he's just asked very generally, uh, sort of okay. what 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 sort of advice would you have for someone? Looking okay, at so the first thing is to go. So in terms of um, in terms of real advice, if you've got a ran prospective randomized control trial that you want to run, uh, then you're going to need to get it funded. You're going to need to get a clinical trials unit. Um, oh yeah, is there a source? Yeah, the source is coming. So um, the place to go and look is on the um, Equator Network website. So everyone will be familiar with Consort. Some of you will be familiar with Prisma. Some of you may be familiar with Stro. These are just two or three very uh, more commonly used reporting guidelines for uh, the development of particular types of reports. So Consort is for randomized trials. Pris
scratch has been resurfaced, I don't want to see it anymore. Because it just brings up everything. I think we've uh, lost your audio, bro. Better? Yeah. Thanks. Sorry, I think someone walked past with a set of um, uh, headphones on and my Bluetooth picked it up. Got to kill my Bluetooth before that happens again. Apologies, guys. So uh, where was I? So Prisma, Strobe, Consort, those are for particular study designs. But there's also one for the uh, writing of randomized control trial protocols. So go to the Equator Network, which is Doug Altman's uh, work um, out of the Center of Statistics and Medicine. Great guy, unfortunately, the late Doug Altman. But he put together Consort and then the Equator Network fell uh, out from that over the last 25 years. Jump on there. I can't actually remember the name of the um, uh, short guide. If somebody's on the web at the moment, they could probably have a look and stick it in the chat. Um, I've got one other question uh, to ask you as well, if that's all right. Mm -hmm. uh, so someone's asked, what's the best way to find a topic to conduct a systematic review on? How can you identify where there's a paucity in the literature? Someone has said. Oh, these are good questions. Um, so, uh, yeah, there you go. Creator Network popped up. Perfect. How do you identify the paucity in the literature? Well, some of it is just our day-to-day -day practice in the sense of if people argue about it all the time, there's probably not much literature about it. Uh, or there's probably not much definitive literature about it. There might, might be much written, but probably not an actual answer. Um, so if it comes up in the trauma meeting or it comes up in your MDTs a lot and people argue the toss, then chances are, you are you're onto a winner in terms of no definitive answer. Then I would do a scoping review. What is a scoping review? So a scoping review is don't worry about the systematic element of a systematic review. Jump onto PubMed or whatever you're used to using, doesn't matter and just chuck in some word soup that is relevant. So what are the types of words that you're interested in? Well, you're interested in the same types of words that I gave you a little bit earlier on. So I'll stick those up again now. So if you could put in some descriptors of these areas, population, what treatments you're interested in, what types of outcomes you want to measure, pop those into PubMed, and you will find the sorts of studies that are of interest to you uh, in answering your question. Um, one of the key things about conducting a systematic review is a decision at the front about whether you're going to be involved. And again, I'm making the assumption that we're interested in doing a systematic review of interventions or, or studies of interventions as opposed to diagnostic treatment accuracy. Um, uh, sorry, diagnostic testing accuracy or, or risk factor analysis or something like that. So assuming you're looking at two types of orthopedic treatments, then do the scoping view uh, review in the sense of get all your hits and you'll get many thousands and then decide whether you want to limit it to randomized controlled trials or not. And that's quite easy as a filter on PubMed or, or Medline or whichever one you use. And you can just hit the RCT uh, tick box and that'll shrink it from a very big number to a very small number really quickly. Uh, and then you'll have a manageable amount of work. Uh, in general, I have I spent a long time working around this area. Uh, I have decided now not to do any systematic reviews of non-randomized studies. Uh, there's a very long, quite heavy duty statistical reasons behind that. But the reality is, is that the systematic reviews and meta-analysis of those types of studies is very prone to giving us very spurious answers. So I've stopped doing that. If you really want to get involved in doing systematic reviews uh, on a serious level, then contact me uh, or contact the Cochrane Bone, Joint and Muscle Trauma Group. If you want to do musculoskeletal, there's a musculoskeletal group as well. So elective orthopedics. But if you want to do trauma, uh, then I run that group. Uh, and I would say that's a slightly longer term piece of work. You need a year to turn out a Cochrane review or an update of a Cochrane. But it will be a much, much better piece of work than trying to knock out a review, which you then desperately try and shoehorn into a, into a journal because that's difficult. Getting a systematic review into a journal is, is challenging. 
Perfect. Thank you very much for that. I've got one more question, if that's okay, before I let yeah. you get back um, back to everything. Uh, so I've got someone who's asking, if I started an RCT at a trust, how long does it normally take to complete? And if I leave a trust before completing it, uh, do I still have sort of a chance to be one of the authors or still be involved? Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to assume that when they're asking that, they're asking uh, as a as an associate PI rather than setting up a whole RCT. Because they probably the turnaround time for a whole RCT is somewhere between five and eight years. Um, mm. So it just doesn't make any sense. The question doesn't make any sense in that in that light. Sure. So sure. assuming you're talking about an associate PI, you can actually one of the one of the problems that the scheme initially had was that you couldn't migrate round. And and I'm beginning to talk to uh, regional uh, TPDs to say. I'd like to open the study across all of the hospitals on your program so that an associate PI can easily kind of slip between trusts. Uh, at the moment, you can continue and you and as long as as long as you continue working on it and, and um, stay in touch with the team, then you'll you'll be uh, over the line for the authorship point of view as well. So an associate PI is not bound by which hospital they're particularly working. Of course, when it comes to the nuts and bolts of getting a study set up or recruiting patients, being on site is is ninety percent of the battle. But later down the line, when there's things like data queries coming back or a review of papers or whatever it is, you can do that remotely as well. But I am trying to move to the position where if you are on West Midlands rotation, you're going to have more than one hospital on your rotation doing any one of these studies so that you can drop it in one hospital and then pick it up in another. Sure, perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Uh, thanks for the, for the questions, guys. Uh, we'll see if we have any others um, at the end, but um, I'm just gonna leave things back to you for anything else that you want to go through as well. Um, I'm pretty happy, I think, Vikram. Those are yeah, those are the perfect. main things I was um, that I was sure. planning on speaking about. I'm delighted to speak about anything uh, further tonight, or or down the line, if people have got ideas to feed to you about either future research questions, uh, sorry, research areas they want to talk about in a bit more detail, um, or or if there's some particular papers. Uh, I know we spoke about that just before the the meeting. Uh, sorry, I've just got one more question actually someone has just asked how does one become an honorary clinical fellow an honorary clinical fellow i didn't even know what that is um so uh an an honorary fellow or an honorary post is just one where you don't take any um <laughs> that's a laugh. um it's just one where you don't take any money so uh, you can be an honorary anything and normally people hand out honorary contracts usually uh, just means you uh contracts. you don't get paid for it from uh yeah from, uh, exactly what I'm that's what it means yeah what it means he's not getting paid i mean i'm an honorary orthopedic surgeon uh which uh uh i mean maybe that's a good thing um uh that i don't have to take any money for my work um i wouldn't i wouldn't get too hung up all those sorts of titles are um are are just slightly arbitrary yeah, the, I you know, even even at, even at um, a, an SHA level, I know people who become honorary clinical fellows, sort of left, right, and centre. It just means they do some research as part of a group, potentially at a different hospital to the one they they work at. They get access to the hospital. Um, they don't get paid for doing the work there, but you know, it's just uh, an extra role, really. Um, I think some people go CV hunting for it. Mm. Um, the the reason why we need honorary uh, fellow uh, contracts. I mean, I, I joke about it. I actually am an honorary speed surgeon because I'm employed by the university, but I have to go and work in the hospital and I still have to NHS indemnity, et cetera, et cetera. So I do need to have an honorary contract with the hospital. That signs me up to all the same contractual obligations that any other consultant has, uh, except there's no financial bit tied to it, as you're saying, Vikram. Um, we make people who have clinical uh, substantive contracts uh, or training contracts Get honorary contracts with the university for similar reasons um, because if you're running a study or involved in running a study then the university has legal obligations for the conduct of that and therefore they require you to sign up to sort of do what they tell them do what do for you to do what you're told essentially by the university um, so it's just they're essentially contracts that just keep 
the institution safe and, and, and able to manipulate their people to make sure that they're doing their mandatory training or whatever it is. Um, I don't think anyone in the interview is particularly interested if you run off a long list of honorary contracts that you hold. Okay, great. Um, and one more question someone's asked is, what is your view on the Blom BMJ paper? <laughs> no, no, I think it was a laudable aim, okay? So the idea, um, look, you just think about it, just take a step back from the paper, just think about healthcare in the 21st century. So we've got all this historical um, interventions out there, many of which are still being used uh, and, and have come into being with very low evidence base. And some of them are kind of nailed on, some of them are pretty dubious, um, or at least arguably dubious. And then we've got all the future potential interventions coming down the line. We've got this enormous waiting list of people. And uh, there's a great stat from the United States where the number of people that have, uh, uh, oh, sorry, the, the incidence of spinal disease in your population in the States is more closely related to the number of spinal surgeons than it is to any other uh, predictive factor about the population. Um, what that really means is, is if you, if you create lots of shoulder surgeons, they'll do lots of shoulder arthroscopy. It doesn't really matter whether shoulder arthroscopy is effective or not. So we do need to be cognizant of the fact that there's a lot of historical stuff which might not be, uh, might not be very effective. And there's a lot of future stuff which ought to be rigorously tested before it arrives in clinical practice going forwards. Um, and we have this enormous burden of work. So if we're spending time doing dubious quality work, like doing meniscal debridements of 70 year old people with OA and wash out knees, like I did when I was a trainee, I washed out a bunch of people's knees, right? And uh, I could have done some other more effective surgery for other people. Um, so there's an opportunity cost. So the idea that we ought to be rigorous about testing our interventions, I think is one that you can defend in many different ways without even talking about money. Um, mostly just due to opportunity cost for other people receiving treatment in a more timely fashion. Um, and the avoidance of harm because nearly everything that we do has some degree of harm associated with it for some patients. So I think the idea of looking for common work that we do, which might not have a very good evidence base, is a really laudable objective. And, you know, challenging dogma is a perfectly reasonable thing to do. So throwing it out there that, you know, what a bunch of us are doing in our practice may not be that effective is, um, is confrontational uh, and it's challenging. But I, I don't particularly have a problem with it. I think the issue comes where if you're going to take an intervention, which really there's essentially zero equipoise, the one that they really, really upset everyone about is total hip replacement, right? So even total knee arthroplasty, there's a beautiful trial in uh, Australia showing that uh, total knee arthroplasty is less effective than um, uh, bariatric surgery for the reduction of knee pain and function uh, or improvement of knee pain and function. So if you take... Um, uh, if you take something as nailed on as total hip replacement and then you say there's no trials, I think that's OK. But you do need to say, but I don't think that we should do a trial in this area um, because of all of these data, which I think are adequate to demonstrate its effectiveness, which then begs the question of why did you ask the question of whether there are any randomized controlled trials in an area where, you, where the answer is not going to going to move you forwards so i think the paper as a as a as a concept is a good idea um, maybe just around the edges on one of the two of the interventions um, they've asked the question which just isn't relevant um, i i don't you know it doesn't it doesn't worry me but if you're if if you're a commissioner or you're really worried about protecting services having your research or, or participating in the delivery of research, which is then deliberately or through ignorance misinterpreted, that might then limit the, the opportunity for patients to get a really effective treatment. That's where I get a little bit nervous. And that's, that's essentially what the BOA is saying in their pushback.
Perfect. Um, I think we're going to stop with the questions there. I think, uh, okay. you know, if we if we keep things open, people are going to be asking you questions for forever, quite frankly. Um, so I just want to say, you know, thank you so much. Uh, this was an excellent session. Uh, I think it was really good that people got so involved and it's been really interactive and you've answered so many people's questions on uh, on so many different aspects of research. Um, if you don't mind just staying with us for a debrief very quickly, I'm just going to put up the uh, feedback link for everyone else, uh, if you don't mind. Uh, for yeah, pleasure. Thanks, everyone, for great questions. And the door's always open. If you can't find me on Google, then uh, there's something wrong with you or, or your computer. Perfect. Okay. Vic, you can probably take us into a breakout room, mate. Yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. <laughs> While your mouse is vigorously moving around the screen. Oh, hi there. Um, yeah. So I don't think the uh, feedback link's working. Um, it's saying that it's no longer accepting responses for everyone. Okay, it's not working. All right, don't worry about it in that case. I just have to leave it up. I mean, 